Okay, aloha. Welcome to lecture 15, the final lecture. Skin, the great cover up. Uh, this time around, we're going to be discussing chapter 18, which is the integumentary system. So, the integumentary system is composed of everything that covers up the outside of your body, such as skin, hair, nails, etc. Uh, the skin is the largest organ in your body, and it plays an absolutely crucial, critical, cannot be overstated its importance, uh, critical role in protecting your insides from the outside world. Uh, most of you know that the skin is made up of multiple layers. Uh, these layers can be subdivided into two, um, two basic groups. You have the epidermis which is the outer layer of, epith of epithelium that covers the whole outside of your body. And then you have the dermis, which is the deeper layer of uh, primarily connective tissue. Um, so the epidermis is composed, this guy up here is composed of surface ectoderm. And then the dermis, unlike the epidermis is um, composed of mesenchyme tissue that was uh, developed from the mesoderm. So in the beginning, there was only ectoderm. This stuff, of course, used to be called the hypoblast when it was just a bilaminar embryonic disc. And then, uh, of course, the hypoblast then gives rise to the mesoderm, at which point we have ectoderm and mesoderm, right? So uh, at any rate, the, uh, the top diagram is uh, a four week old embryo. So the mesoderm is already formed. And at about seven weeks, you start to see this guy up here. You start to see this uh, layer of squamous cells appear on top of the surface ectoderm called the periderm. So now we have the basal layer and the periderm. Now, um, the basal layer is going to keep proliferating. It's going to make more periderm. And as it does so, the existing periderm is going to slough off uh, and form a waxy covering over the whole fetus called the vernix caseosa. The vernix is meant to protect the embryo from constant exposure to the amniotic fluid, which is, you know, slightly caustic. Uh, you know, and it's also got uh, urine and other stuff in it that's irritating to the skin. So this guy's going to proliferate, make more and more layers of cells. And as it does so, these guys are going to slough off. And uh, these are highly keratinized cells. So yeah, they're, they're waxy. Uh, so while the top layer is keratinizing and being sloughed off, uh, this basal layer is continuing to germinate and it's making more and more and more layers. So once we have more than one germinal or one more than one layer, underneath the periderm, now this bottom layer becomes the stratum germinativum or germinativum. I guess it really depends on which professor you're, lis you're listening to. But anyway, so yes, we have the bottom layer, which is the stratum germinativum. And then we have the uh, intermediate layer. And of course the periderm, which is the intermediate layer keratinizing and sloughing off. Meanwhile, there are also some cells which are derived from neural crest tissue. Um, and this neural and these neural crest tissues are sorry, these neural crest cells are going to differentiate into melanoblasts and they're going to migrate upwards. Uh, interestingly enough, these melanoblast cells, which are the precursors to melanocytes, are not derived from mesenchyme. Might be important to remember that on the exam. So let me repeat it one more time. Melanocytes are derived from neural crest tissue, not from mesenchyme or surface ectoderm. They're derived from neural crest tissues. So just one more time for emphasis, melanoblasts, melanocytes are derived from neural crest tissue. Anyway. miss anything. Oh, while all this is happening, 
you're also so as as these layers continue to form we get more and more and more and more layers then these cells start to bunch up together and this happens in a genetically predetermined way which causes all these hills and valleys in the skin that are known as uh, papillary ridges which we know as fingerprints these guys are gonna to start to appear at about 10 weeks and they are fully formed and permanent. Um, I'm sorry, I called them papillary ridges. They are epidermal ridges. So in the skin, they're epidermal ridges. We're gonna to get to papillary ridges in a minute. So in the epidermis, they are called epidermal ridges, which we call fingerprints. And um, at any rate, yeah, these things start to appear at 10 weeks. They're fully developed and permanent by 17 weeks. And then, of course, like I mentioned before, while all of this is busy happening, you've also got these neural crest cells that are invading the mesenchyme and migrating upwards that are uh, differentiating into melanoblasts, which are ultimately destined to become melanocytes. Um, so as we move further along in development, more and more layers are added. And by about 21 weeks, we have something that looks like this. Um, the paraderm is going to disappear. Uh, this guy right up here, this paraderm is going to disappear and it's going to give way to the stratum corneum. So the stratum corneum forms in a pretty particular way. Uh, the stratum germativum, uh, this guy way down here, he makes new cells. As he makes new cells, he pushes these other cells upwards. And as he pushes these cells upwards, once they get a certain distance away from the germinative layer, they start to form granules. And uh, these granule filled cells become then part of stratum granulosum. Stratum granulosum then gets pushed through the next layer of cells called stratum lucidum. Now stratum lucidum is made up of a whole bunch of um, poorly differentiated, um, poorly defined, uh, they've got poorly defined boundaries, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, these guys are filled with an intermediate form of keratin, right? It's a bunch of cells with poorly defined uh, boundaries that are filled with an intermediate form of uh, keratin. Anyway, as stratum granulosum gets pushed up through stratum lucidum, these granules are released and these granules uh, contain all the different um, factors that convert or that cause the uh, keratin to bind together. And then that keratin then binds all to the outside of the cells and makes them nice and waxy and waterproof and sticky. And then they stick together. And this is where stratum corneum comes from. So that's the basic process, right? Now, while all of this is busy happening, of course, uh, the mesenchyme then comes and fills right up in uh, underneath these epidermal ridges and forms what are called papillary ridges, right? So, well, in the mesoderm also, in the meantime, mesoderm, why am I saying mesoderm? <laughs> the um, dermis, okay, so we have the epidermis up here and down here we have the dermis. So the dermal layer has been busy proliferating and dividing into a couple of different layers as well. So we have the papillary layer up here and then we have the reticular layer down here. Now the reticular layer is made up mostly of um, irregular dense fibrous tissue, right? In the papillary layer, um, the tissue is even a little less organized and not quite as densely packed, but it fills up into these dermal ridges. And, as, and the reason that it fills up into those dermal ridges um, is to provide blood supply. Because as we mentioned in um, previous chapters, one of the main things that mesenchyme gives rise to is uh, blood vessels and blood cells, um, vascular tissue, right? So as this stuff fills up in here, it starts to form capillaries and, um, and other blood vessels that then supply these basal layers of the, derma, uh, of the epidermis. Um, blood vessels are not the only thing that live in those ridges. Uh, also inside these papillary ridges, uh, we have nerve endings and nerve organelles, right? Such as pressure sensors, temperature sensors, uh, and uh, plain old pain nerve endings and all the different stuff that is associated with our sense of touch and temperature and, and all the different sensations that our hands experience. 
Um, and anyway, so that's and that's about it for the development of skin. So we're going to move on now uh, to talk about hair and glands. Um, we're going to talk about them together because they form in very similar ways. Hair is the most complicated one, so we're going to hit that one first, okay? So hair starts to form between 9 and 12 weeks, but you can't really see it until around 20 weeks. So you start off with, you know, these epidermal cells, and you get a local proliferation of epidermal cells called a hair bud, right? Demonstrated right here. So this hair bud is going to burrow down deeper into the uh, mesenchyme, into the connective tissue down here. And uh, it's going to become, as it gets bigger and more bulb shaped, it's going to be, become a hair bulb because some PhD needed to change the name so that he could get his PhD. <laughs> um, so anyway, the cells that form the hair bulb are also called the germinal matrix. This is going to eventually become the part of the follicle that builds the hair. So, uh, and as this root continues to move downward, the bulb starts to enlarge. And as the bulb enlarges, some of the local mesenchyme starts to invaginate into the end of this thing, forming a papillae or a papilla. Sorry, papillae is plural. Uh, this forms the hair papilla. While this is happening, uh, some local um, melanocytes uh, are busy migrating into the area. And these guys are eventually gonna become what colors the hair. So you get these melanocytes that are gonna eventually differentiate fully into, uh, or sorry, melanoblasts that are eventually gonna differentiate into melanocytes and, and you turn the hair whatever color it's gonna be, right? Um, so the cells that line the shaft, these guys right here, are called the epidermal, uh, well, either the epidermal or the, der or the dermal, depending on which level in the skin that you're at at the moment, uh, but they're the root sheath. So you have the dermal root sheath and the epidermal root sheath, just depending on how deep down you are at the time. Um, so some of the mesenchyme immediately surrounding the root sheath starts to differentiate. This stuff, this pink stuff out here starts to differentiate and it starts forming this stuff. This is smooth muscle. So it starts to differentiate into smooth muscle cells and these smooth muscle cells are gonna form the erector pili, mu pili muscle uh, that causes the hair to stand up on end and gives us chicken skin. So basically the way it works, you have the germinal matrix down here that adds cells to the hair and then uh, keratinizes them. And as they get keratinized, they get pushed upward and eventually they're gonna erupt out of the skin as a hair. Uh, so the first hair starts to penetrate the skin at around 12 weeks. And by about 17 weeks, there is an awful lot of it in the form of lanugo, which you remember is the peach fuzz that surrounds the fetus in order to keep that uh, vernix caseosa attached, right, to protect the baby from the prolonged exposure to the amniotic fluid. Now glands form basically the same way. So uh, we'll start with sweat glands because they're simple. Uh, there are two kinds of sweat, sweat glands you need to know about. The first kind is ecrine and the other kind is apocrine. So basically the difference is that an ecrine sweat gland stands alone, kind of like this guy. Uh, and they don't have an example on this diagram of an apocrine, but an apocrine basically is associated with a, uh, with a hair follicle, okay? So the ecrine glands, we'll start with those. Um, you start with the same thing, a budding of cell in the epidermis, uh, and then this budding of cells starts to penetrate down into the mesenchyme, and it starts to twist and turn. And as it starts to twist and turn and branch off, it starts to hollow out, forming a long, hollow, twisting, turning lumen, which is the sweat gland. Uh, and down here in the twisting, turning lumen, we have glandular tissue that forms the sweat by basically filling itself up and rupturing. Um, and then the sweat, of course, comes out this long lumen onto the skin to cool it off. Uh, apocrine glands form exactly the same way. It's just that the opening, instead of being into the skin, will be up here at the top of the hair follicle. Now, sebaceous glands form in a really similar way, a little bit deeper down on the, um, um, what's it called again? 
uh, the root sheath, right? So a little bit further down on the root sheath, uh, down into the dermal layers, you start to see this uh, outpouching of cells, this proliferation, this budding of cells off of the root sheath. And then this budding of cells starts to invaginate into the surrounding connective tissue, the surrounding mesenchyme tissue. And as it does, in this case, it starts to form little alveoli and alveolar ducts and, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, which then becomes the glandular tissue. And these guys produce this substance called sebum. And they basically, the glandular cells, fill themselves up with sebum and then rupture into the gland. And then the uh, sebum is excreted out into the hair and then out onto the skin through the hair follicle. And that's about it for glands. Um, so we covered what? Um, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, hair follicles, all that good stuff. So up, up next is uh, fingernails. Fingernails are pretty simple. There's really not a lot to say about how they develop. Uh, they start developing at about 10 weeks. The toenails develop about four weeks later. Uh, in the area that the nail is gonna form, the epidermis thickens and it thickens into what's called a nail, feel, a nail field. <laughs> Try to say that five times fast. So, and then at the proximal part and around the edges around here, the nail field is uh, overlapped by a flap of tissue. So this is called the proximal nail fold. And then this would be called the lateral nail folds. And basically the nail folds, cells within the nail folds serve a similar function as the, as the germinal matrix in the hair follicle. They uh, reproduce, they make new cells, and then they keratinize the heck out of them so that they become these nice hard fingernails. And then as they keratinize them, they push their way out and the nail grows along the nail field uh, within the boundaries of the uh, nail folds. Initially, there is a layer of skin covering the fingernails called the eponychium. And then uh, the eponychium eventually is shed and you're left with this little bit of skin. Uh, so this, this part where the skin attaches directly underneath the nail uh, is called the hyponychium. And I think the book had a couple of typos or, or it confused the terms, but I looked it up, I looked it up elsewhere. And yeah, for sure, this layer of skin covering the nail is the eponychium. And then uh, this layer of skin directly under the nail, right, right up in here is called the hyponychium. And that's pretty much it. That's how nails are made. So um, after that, we are going to cover the formation of mammary glands, the things that make us mammals. So during the fourth week, once the embryo is folded, you, uh, you start to see this thickened strip of ectoderm called the mammary crest. So this mammary crest um, runs the entire length of the uh, ventral side, uh, yeah, the ventral side of the embryo. Why do you think it might be that it runs the entire length of the embryo initially? Well, because if you were a dog or a cat or whatever else, you'd have a whole row of mammary glands. <laughs> you'd have a whole row of nipples here that would need to form. But us being humans, um, we don't need all that. So what happens is after a while, all of this tissue degenerates and gets recycled, except for this little bit in the pectoral region right here, um, the remains of the mammary crest. Um, so mammary glands are basically modified and highly specialized sweat glands, which is also true of cows and goats and Everything else, everything else that makes milk for its young. So just remember that when you're drinking cow's milk, you're drinking modified cow sweat. Anyway, um, so mammary, so anyway, because of that, they develop in a, in a similar way, or at least at the beginning they do. So you start to get this local uh, budding of epidermal cells and they invaginate down into the surrounding mesenchyme and as they start to grow downward into the deeper layers of the connective tissue, they start to branch out. And then as they start to branch out, they start to hollow out. Guess how? Of course, apoptosis is the easiest way to make a lumen. Uh, and as they begin to branch out and form these lumens, you have glandular tissue in the bottom. And then uh, these long tubes called lactiferous ducts and lactiferous glands. 
And basically what happens is in the lactiferous glands, these cells reproduce themselves, fill themselves up with the milk substance and then rupture into um, the lactiferous duct and excrete the milk and it comes out the areola of the breast and baby gets a nice meal. There's not much more to it than that. It's really a pretty simple process. And by the way, this happens in men just the same as it does on women. Uh, to the same extent, in fact, men have exactly the same amount of lactiferous ducts and glands as, as women do, but these things are um, hormonally activated, which is why generally women only lactate when they're pregnant and men generally don't lactate. Now, it's time to talk about teeth. So teeth are a little more involved. Uh, but basically what's gonna happen <clears throat> is around the sixth week of development. Now you remember we talked about the um, first pharyngeal arch, how it develops these two significant prominences, the uh, mandibular prominence and the maxillary prominence. So up here, just to orient you, this would be the maxillary prominence and this would be the mandibular prominence down here. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the tongue is developing in between the two. So what we start to see is we start to see this, um, oh, how did I put it in the notes? I'm gonna read the notes for this part. <laughs> uh, this thickening, thank you, I can't think of the word. Uh, you start to see this thickening of the surface ectoderm in the mouth that forms um, in a, in a U-shape all the way around the whole uh, length of the pharyngeal arches, the whole length of the mammillary, uh, mammillary the mandibular process and the um, maxillary process, right? So this U-shaped thickening of the ectoderm is called the dental lamina. And eventually by about, uh, I wanna say week seven, this guy is going to have um, formed 10 on each side, 10 centers of growth, 10 developmental centers uh, called tooth buds, right? So the first one that forms is the uh, central on the bottom, the first two that form, and then the two central tooth buds on the maxillary process form. And then from there, they grow from the front to the back. They bud off from the front to the back, which if you'll notice is exactly the same pattern that children gain, gain teeth as infants. Funny how that happens. Um, but yeah, these uh, central mandibular tooth buds are gonna eventually become the two cent, uh, lower incisors, the two center lower incisors. Same thing up here, the, the central maxillary tooth buds are gonna eventually become the central upper incisors. Uh, so anyway, what happens next is uh, this tooth bud begins to grow and it begins to keep uh, penetrating into the surrounding mesenchyme. As that happens, the surrounding or the mesenchyme immediately deep to it starts to differentiate and proliferate and it forms this structure called the dental papilla. This dental papilla invaginates into the tooth bud, giving it this cap shape. As soon as that happens, the tooth bud changes names because somebody needed a PhD. It changes names from the tooth bud to the enamel organ. So this is called the um, cap stage, the cap stage of tooth development. You have the dental papilla and the enamel organ. So the two of these together are collectively called the um, dental, I'm sorry, the tooth germ, not the dental germ, the, the tooth germ. So the, now we have the tooth germ, which is made up of the dental papilla and the enamel organ. So um, this enamel organ and papilla are gonna continue to differentiate and proliferate and grow. Uh, this is gonna in invaginate further into the tooth bud as, uh, excuse me, into the enamel organ as the enamel organ continues to grow around it. And we're gonna end up with something that looks a little more bell-shaped. At least some PhD student somewhere thought it looked like a bell. So now we call this the bell stage, and this is at about 10 weeks. Now, during the <clears throat> early part of the bell stage, this secondary budding starts to appear off of the um, dental lamina, off of the remnants of the dental lamina. This secondary budding is going to eventually become the permanent tooth. It's going to migrate clear in the heck down here to the base 
of the deciduous. So de deciduous means the baby teeth, right? Um, the teeth that we shed. So it's going to migrate all the way down to the base of the baby tooth and it's going to hang out there and start developing into a permanent tooth. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on, right? Um, it's worth mentioning here um, that the molars, the, the last few molars on the top and the bottom do not have uh, deciduous teeth. They don't have baby teeth. They are going to eventually form from the original dental laminae um, on the top and the bottom and, and just come out already permanent teeth. There's no, um, we don't lose those back molars at any point. They just grow in later in childhood. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, during the bell stage, we also start to see uh, the papilla and the, or and the enamel organ further differentiate and they begin to form uh, this stuff down here that's called the dental pulp and this stuff in here that's called the enamel matrix. Now the enamel matrix is surrounded on either side by epithelial tissue called the inner enamel epithelium and the outer enamel epithelium. Um, while all of this is busy happening, you start to see this um, mesenchyme tissue immediately around the turf tooth germ that starts to become densely packed and it starts to become fibrous and it starts to differentiate into a structure initially called the dental sac. So the dental sac is eventually going to continue to differentiate and form the tooth socket, which we call the dental papilla, uh, and also the periodontal ligament, which holds the tooth into the socket. Now at 28 weeks, we have something that looks like this. Okay. Uh, so the pulp develops a layer of cells called odontoblasts. And they're here on this picture, but initially they form right up, butted up against um, the internal um, enamel epithelium, right? The inner enamel epithelium. Uh, and this layer of cells forms right up against that called the odontoblasts. And what the odontoblasts do is they start creating a substance called dentin. So as this dentin forms, it lays down layer and layer and layer and layer of dentin. And as it lays down these layers of dentin, then the layer of odontoblasts regresses back further and further and further into the tooth, narrowing uh, the pulp. Now, uh, at the same time, this layer of uh, the internal, the inner enamel epithelium, <laughs> these words are hard to say, uh, the inner, um, enamel epithelium differentiates into a group of cells called amnioblasts. And these amnioblasts begin laying down little rods of enamel that we call prisms in a nice straight little row like you see right here, right? These enamel prisms. So as these amnioblasts lay these things down, then they regress and retreat further and further away from that. So they start re regressing towards the outer um, enamel epithelium, right? So this space starts to get smaller. So basically you start right here, the odontoblasts build dentin this way inward and the amnioblasts develop enamel going this way, right? And so here you see the enamel starting to develop and the dentin, uh, the dentin starting to develop. And anyway, what happens eventually is the uh, inner layer of the enamel epithelium and the outer layer of the enamel epithelium begins to uh, come together down here at the bottom and it forms a fold, right? And this fold is called the epithelial root sheath. Now, when these two sides come into contact with each other, forming this root sheath, it stimulates this dentin to start growing downward. Now you'll notice that down here, the tooth socket is busy forming, right? This, uh, this, mesenchyme is ossifying into a tooth socket. And so there's nowhere for this thing to go downward. So what happens is as this dentin grows downward, it pushes the crown of the tooth upward towards the gums. Makes sense. And of course the original dental lamina is degenerating by now. This uh, secondary tooth bud that's gonna become the permanent tooth is migrating down. But remember that really just means that it's all of this stuff is growing up and this thing's kind of staying anyway. 
differential tissue growth is what causes cells to migrate. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, as these um, uh, odontoblasts, as these odontoblasts lay down this dentin and retreat back, they leave behind them um, their, um, man, I'm having trouble with words tonight. Um, they're leaving behind, behind them their uh, cytoplasmic processes, right? So this is like a cytoplasmic process coming off of these odontoblasts and they're called uh, the odontoblastic processes. Um, it's actually one of the reasons that the tissue, that the dentine tissue is porous, which is one of the reasons that once you get through the enamel into the dentine, it becomes very, very, very sensitive to temperature and wind and things like that as uh, these uh, odontoblastic processes leave this tissue very porous. Now, it's also worth mentioning at this point that this stuff right here, this tooth enamel, is the hardest stub substance, the, the hardest tissue that is formed in our entire body. There is nothing our body makes that is harder than this tooth enamel. Second place right behind it is dentin. Dentin is the second hardest tissue that is formed anywhere inside of our body. Um, it's just a side note, I just think it's kind of cool. Um, So anyway, as this process continues, uh, we end up with something like this. Now, I just want to get you a little bit oriented because we fast forwarded quite a bit in time. So this diagram on the left would be uh, an infant, probably at a few months old, where they're beginning to teeth, but the tooth hasn't broken through the surface yet. In fact, uh, they're usually really fussy and pulling at their ears and kind of fevering at this stage of the game. And if you put your fingers on the gums, a lot of times you can actually feel these teeth underneath the gums as they're trying to poke through. It's really irritating to the poor baby. And uh, at least as irritating to the poor parents. Those of you with kids know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, so anyway, um, So typically you wouldn't reach this stage until a few months after birth. Now, every kid is a little different. Um, some of my children had already cut teeth through by three weeks old. We had some friends that were living in uh, Temple View apartments in TVA uh, that actually their baby was born with their two bottom teeth already in. Um, but typically this will happen at about three months. Now the book talks about, uh, the book says six six months but plenty of other experts and myself you know through the experience of hundreds and hundreds of pediatric patients at my practice so i would consider myself kind of an expert on the subject and i'm telling you it's more like three months on average about three months kids usually start cutting teeth they're usually poking through by four or five months they've got a few teeth so my class we're going to say this is three months <laughs> all right uh, so then, of course, what happens is this root continues to grow and this uh, pulp continues to narrow. And as this dentin continues to fill in and this root or and this pulp continues to narrow, it narrows into something called the root canal, right? And through the root canal, the nerves and the blood vessels go in and out. And that's about all there's room for at the end of the process. Now, eventually, this thing's going to cut its way up through the gums and it's going to get bigger and bigger until you have this nice, pretty crown of the tooth sticking out of the gums, and then the root diving down underneath, being held in by these beautiful periodontal ligaments by all, you know, and this will be the tooth socket and the jaw. This is later in childhood, <laughs> okay? There's also a layer of cement um, up against the dentin here that helps to hold it even more secure, okay? Uh, there's a lot more to the whole process of forming the dental papillae and the, and the periodontal ligaments, but it's not really important for our purposes. So I'm going to skip most of that and just say, you know, okay, this is all formed from that tissue that became the dental sac. Okay. Uh, now what happens is, of course, the tooth continues to grow out. And while all this is happening, remember this guy down here? Yeah, this is the developing permanent tooth. <laughs> 
So this developing permanent tooth is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you'll notice that it's all the way encased in bone. So how does it have room to grow? Well, the answer to that is the osteoclasts uh, in the area basically clear a path. They start dissolving all this bone and they clear a path for this guy to grow through. And eventually he's gonna puncture into this tooth socket. And once that happens, then the osteoclasts begin to dissolve the root from the bottom upward. And as this root becomes dissolved, the anchor that's holding the tooth in becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And as that anchor becomes shorter and shorter, this tooth begins to wiggle and it starts to get loose. And eventually enough of the root has been dissolved away that this tooth just falls out or gets knocked out or the kid pulls it out or dad pulls it out with a piece of dental floss. But yeah, eventually enough of this root gets um, eaten away by the osteoclast that the tooth can come out, which leaves a nice clear path for the permanent tooth to just grow up through the same hole, which is what it does in an ideal situation. Now I know there's all kinds of other ways that this happens and all kinds of not normal and pathological ways that this happens. But again, this class is just concerned with what normally happens, normal development of, of um, fetuses and neonates. Uh, so yeah, that's the way teeth develop. Uh, and that is the end of the class. Congratulations, we made it through the very last lecture. If you have any questions or need any clarification, please, like I always say every single time I lecture, bring those questions with you to the Zoom meeting on Thursday. See if you can stump me. Um, if you can, everybody gets you know a chance for extra credit. <clears throat> but yeah, if you have anything that you don't understand or that you need more clarification about, please bring those questions with you on Thursday. Make sure you write them down so you don't forget them. Um, this coming Thursday, we're going to um, <clears throat> mostly, so next week is gonna be extra credit week basically. Uh, I know a few of you are already doing it. I'm going to offer an opportunity for some others who are interested to put together a PowerPoint presentation on one of the chapters in the book that we didn't cover because there are several chapters we didn't cover. We don't have time to cover them all. I covered the ones that I feel like are the most important, at least to me, um, <clears throat> or at least the most interesting to me. Uh, perks of being the teacher, I guess. But anyway, if you would like to put together a PowerPoint on one of the one of the chapters that we didn't cover, uh, you would receive a substantial amount of extra credit for that. Um, if you already have an A or you're close to an A, you know, you don't need to do this. It's more extra credit than you need. Um, if you need a little bit of extra credit to pad your final grade, then all you have to do is watch the PowerPoint presentations that these other class members are putting together. If you watch them and can prove that you watch them by answering a couple of easy questions, then you will receive 10 points for each one that you watch on the quiz of your choice or on the you know, exam of your choice, the midterm or the final. Uh, but it's basically 10 points of extra credit on any, um, on any quiz or exam that you wanna add it to. Now, and that does not take you beyond 100%, okay? The maximum you're allowed to get on any of these with extra credit is 100%. So <laughs> choose carefully which ones you're gonna add the points to. Uh, now, if you have 85% or less at this stage of the game in the class, I would recommend that you put together one of these PowerPoints. And like I said, that's a very substantial amount of extra credit that you receive for doing that. Uh, how much exactly really depends on how much effort you put into it. But if you do a good job, trust me, it will be well worth your effort. Um, so yeah, please bring those questions with you. The other thing that we're going to talk about at the Zoom meeting this week is any questions you might have regarding that extra credit opportunity. Um, and then not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, right before finals week, I will give you guys a good solid review for the final right before your reading days. And I think that's everything. So congratulations, you got through all my lectures. I hope I didn't bore you too much. I find this information fascinating and it's probably a lot more fun to listen to me in person than it is to listen to me in a recording. I apologize for that. I had no control over it. Uh, so I guess that's it. Aloha. We'll see you at the meeting on Thursday, I hope.